Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined today by Mr. Kevin Brittingham of Q, formerly of Advanced Armament Corporation. Yeah. And you've worked with suppressors for like your entire life, basically. Yeah, probably since before I was old enough to own one. <laughs> so. Awesome. So you've agreed to uh, do some Q&A questions yes, with me here. Absolutely. Um, I should point out first, the whole reason that we're here together is we're actually starting work on a pretty cool project. I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. I'm really stoked. Uh, there is basically no print resource out there, good quality one, on the history of suppressors. From no. Maxim through World War II stuff, through all that weird sketchy stuff from the 60s in Vietnam. <laughs> through that explosion of like military and commercial suppressors that kind of put us in the position that we're in today. I think, I mean, you know, for me, of course, I'm biased. I've dedicated my life to silencers and the education and study and production, you know, trying to make it prolific in both the commercial market and the military. Um, so I love the idea of continuing to educate the public and consumers and get good information out there. So. So he's got a pretty good collection of interesting historical suppressors and a significant amount of knowledge on the subject, and we're starting work on a book uh, for Headstamp on that very subject. So it'll be a little while before we're done, uh, but we're in the first stages of it now. And while I had him here, I figured let's get him some questions from you wonderful folks on Patreon who make Forgotten Weapons possible. So uh, I have a couple here at the beginning yep. that are questions that were submitted by a bunch of people Basically always the same question. Probably so, very questions that I get constantly. Yep. So um, let's see. The first one is, why are suppressors on the NFA? Are you familiar? Do you know the history of... Oh, well, I, I believe it's the Game and Fish Commission after the Depression, the fear of people poaching on government land. Okay. This was the end of the Great Depression. There was a lot of poaching, so I can see that. I guess. I guess it's either that or gangsters. But I don't know. That <laughs> yeah, I mean, that gangsters. seems to be what most people think. But I believe the Game and Fish Commission. If Which, you, at this point, like a lot of firearm stuff, it seems very dated. And the problem with making laws, like to undo it, is very difficult. Now we're in a situation where, you know, close to 100 years later, we still have a $200 tax and this long background check to go through to get a muffler for your firearm. Yeah. All right. Um, actually, it's interesting if we, when we look at the Maxim suppressors, mm -hmm. like they did way more business in 22s than in centerfire calibers. Well, I mean, a good third to half the business now is still rimfire, which it should be to me. I mean, I use a silence 22 probably every day. I mean, it's, it, it's the, it's the one that's actually silent. Right. Um, you can shoot it in your backyard in most places. Um, it's just a very usable setup, and it's great for kids, women, yeah, shooting in a more populated area. So it's useful. As Maxim would say, having uh, target competitions in your living room. <laughs> D doing that, <laughs> be being polite to your neighbors. Yeah. yeah addressing noisy cats. or what. <laughs> All will be addressed when we cover Maxim's original advertising. Uh, number two, how will additive manufacturing, aka 3D printing, um, affect uh, suppressor design? It's going to have a great impact at some point. Um, for instance, 10 years ago, we won a contract with SOCOM using additive manufacturing for the cores for uh, the belt-fed machine gun silencers. Uh, the cores were all 3D printed. The technology, and it had to be done with, a, with an exotic material that was very difficult to machine. We had a timeline to meet, so casting and all that just, just wasn't a possibility at the time. And the technology is getting there. You know, there are some companies such as Daniel Defense and SIG now that are bringing that to market. We personally just don't feel that the technology is there to do the production at the scale that we need, at the quality we need yet, uh, and something that's affordable for the consumer. We're probably not more than a few years away from it. Okay. Um, but it's never going to be... There... It's never going to be the sole way to do it. And for instance, I think the way people are doing it now when they're printing the tube is probably wrong. We have tube material that is correct. It's held to tolerance. It's very strong. It's very predictable. It's readily available. It's inexpensive. 
So probably like we did the, with the machine gun silencer, doing the core and, and a tube and a weld, because the welds are very inexpensive with robotic rotary welding now. Hmm. And those welds are cheap and they're very consistent and they're very quick. That's probably the way to do it. I'm not okay. sure that printing the whole tube makes a lot of sense. It's a mistake a lot of people are making now. Do you think there's a potential for any substan like any redesign of the, the core components to be something that you could not? otherwise produce oh it's always been that way you know here's the thing we can always make a silencer quieter but at a cost it's either going to cost you weight complexity strength um you know the cost will go way up the you know the dollar and it depends on what our objectives are um i you know currently we're trying to focus on the commercial market with the new company with q for the most part and it's trying to make things that are practical, utility products that are very usable, that people can afford. Um, so we can always make one quieter. For instance, in a silencer, if we have 10 baffles, every baffle being different is always going to be optimum hmm. for sound suppression. But, you know, how many people are going to buy a $2,000 silencer? Well, but in theory, if you're, pr if you're 3D printing the core... It doesn't cost you any more to make any, every baffle That's different. correct. And you can put architecture into the design that you can't do with, you know, very at all or very easily with traditional mill and lathe. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's, a, there's a lot of great things to it, and it's probably the future. But I just don't think we're there yet for full-on production. Okay. Uh, number three, what is first shot pop, and can it be eliminated? Okay, so first round of first shot pop is when there's oxygen, residual oxygen in the silencer, just like in the atmosphere now, and the flame from the first shot ignites that oxygen and causes, you know, basically like a secondary explosion and cause you know, and that just translates into sound. And so the first shot's always louder. The second shot, there's no oxygen in the can, it was burned with the first shot. And so the first shot's always louder. So you can always put like a bottle cap of water or lithium grease or some artificial environment in the silencer to extinguish that flame initially and it'll be quieter. And sometimes mm -hmm. that'll last for up to 10 shots and it'll make all the shots less. But the first round pop comes from just oxygen being in the silencer. Okay. And so you don't actually have to get rid of the oxygen to prevent it. You just have to prevent that flame. Either way, yeah. Okay. So you could you could get rid of the oxygen by filling it with an inert gas, or you can extinguish the flame and it won't ignite the oxygen. Either way. Filling it with an inert gas seems like an awful lot of work. Seems like, like a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so is that what people are referring to with shooting a suppressor wet? Yeah, that's shooting wet. Okay. It's not like having the whole thing full of water. No. You, you know, there's a couple ways. Um, you can do it with a lithium grease or a Vaseline wire pulling gel. Um, I've always used water and you can dunk the silencer and shake out the excess. If I were being, if, if I were doing silencer testing and being consistent, I'll usually use a, a water bottle, the plastic cap, fill that up, pour it in, shake it and shoot to get a consistent amount. That's about as scientific as I ever got with it. But you know, there are ways in, in the 90s, Al Paulson, who was kind of the expert writer on silencers for that time period, he even did a test where he used, you know, urine in the silencer <laughs> to see if it would work. So really anything that's not flammable, liquid or grease, you put it in there, it's going to work. Okay. Uh, and number four of our, like, massively asked questions was, what are your thoughts on universal military suppressor use? There are elements of the U.S. Army that are, or U.S. military, the Marines, that I guess are starting to talk about issuing silencers to everybody. I've heard suggestions that well, if none of the guns make any noise, you have like, a whole lot less fire suppression capability. And, you know, the enemy's less likely to run away if they don't realize they're being shot at. And they're, I mean, I don't know. They're also less likely to run away if they're all shot. So. <laughs> True. I mean, I, I think the idea of us being invisible, as if you talk about the military, the ability to use a small group of guys with thermal and night vision, any signature reduction is very valuable for our soldier. The idea of, you know, like the MG 42 or whatever, in world war two, the psychological effect, you know, I would think like the hope for our military is we can use small forces and use advantages that we have, um, 
to put fewer guys at risk and to be more effective without having to level towns or drop, you know, 2,000 pound bombs and stuff like this, or, you know, dropping the sun on people. Um, and to go back to the question, when I was 19, the first time I shot a silent gun, an MP5 SD, I didn't understand why, and it was with the military, I didn't understand why every gun didn't have a silencer. And that spawned my first business. And, you know, H&K and, and Knight's Armaments, what, what continued to inspire me, that I thought every gun should have a silencer. It made sense to me the first time I shot a gun with a silencer. And, you, you know, it's kind of been the journey I've been on for the last 28 years. Um, yeah, of okay. course the military, every soldier should have a gun. Uh, everybody that shoots commercially and hunts should have a gun. It's it's noise pollution. It damages your hearing every time you fire a gun without proper ear protection or without a silencer on the gun. It makes total sense. And our job as industry should be to make them so good that you want to use them. I mean, you don't notice them on the gun until you pull the trigger and the gun's not as loud as it would be without it. I heard a really interesting anecdote from a friend of mine um, who was in the Marines in Afghanistan who said when he was in training, uh, he was the 249 gunner. Yeah. And it was a training exercise and he was wearing earplugs. And his squad leader told him to move like four times and he didn't hear him because of his earplugs. And he reacted to that like, geez, you know, this, this is something that could legitimately get me killed in a real firefight and never wore earplugs again because yeah, without I think them, it's he could hear the communication between his squad. And if you could simply, if you could make that easier without permanently destroying everybody's hearing in the process, that, it, that, it, there's a real benefit. It makes sense. At a personal level, me hunting with my children or teaching them to shoot, I can communicate with them hunting, especially I can communicate with them when we're hunting and you know, discuss an animal, we can do things. They can hear me. They can follow instruction, training people to shoot. Mm -hmm. You know, my children are all excellent m marksmen. And I think it's because the silencers reduce so much the recoil, but primarily like Maxim believed that the sound is what scares everyone, the explosion at the muzzle. And that's what causes people to flinch and have poor accuracy. So that's a thing. And then, you know, 15, almost 20 years of my life was devoted to working with the military at some of the highest levels, guys that actually were at risk every day. And, you know, and it was fortunate timing in some sense that we, you know, the, the war starting in 01, it, it, in the 15 years following that of my career, we're all dealing with these guys. And some of the advantages are if you have a team where they all have silencers, they know if someone else is shooting. That's true. You no, know, it's not one of us. The silencer masks the muzzle flash so they can see a flash of the enemy. They know if someone else. And with comms, you know, they can communicate effectively indoors or out while engaging targets when they have silencers on the gun. So there, there's huge benefits. Um, so I like that. I didn't think of that because, you know, we have certain groups within our military where almost all of the engagements are offensive. And many times they're the only ones shooting. And so it's great for those guys to know when they hear, you know, loud gunfire, oh goodness, we're actually in a gunfight now, not an <laughs> offensive action. So um, makes very little sense for the military not to have silencers on all the guns. Then you just think from a hearing loss and disability perspective, like what that costs the taxpayers every year. We wouldn't have to all be seeing those ads for uh, class action lawsuits about right. defective military ear pro. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, Pete says, measuring sound can be complicated with a lot of variables. Is there a standardized way of testing a suppressor that people should be aware of so that comparisons can be made effectively? I'm thinking of casual reviewers more than trained experts. There was a mill standard that was set up almost 40 years ago that was followed. The problem is we don't have an industry group that holds everyone accountable, in hmm. my opinion. So I don't really participate in it anymore because of that, because manufacturers are able to skew results or be dishonest about results, and then it's not a fair comparison. If we had an industry organization that tested everything equally, that would be a thing. So the mill standard was one. But now people are worried about hearing loss, and so mill standard you're measuring at the muzzle of the, the mm -hmm. weapon rather than the shooter's ear. So what's important to you? Um, you know, for me with my shooting, it's almost always my hearing or at the shooter's ear. 
And, and there's somebody, uh, Pew Science, and that might be the website. He's doing some very complex testing now, which is very effective. And he's, he, he's able to get a result and he's giving just a single digit number to kind of rate a silencer based on criteria that he lays out on the website. And he's the only person really trying to tackle that right now. But, you know, the short answer is no, there's not really a, a true standard. Um, the good thing is for the commercial market, there's five or six really great brands out there to, that make great products that have great sound suppression that will serve you well. And if you've got a good local dealer, if not silencer shop is the largest distributor of silencers in, in, in America. And they've got a large video archive on their YouTube mm -hmm. and they give, they give some ratings and impressions and they do some sound testing and it's available on their website. And they're also a great resource. So overall, how important do you think uh, actual a specific decibel reduction is compared to other factors in suppressor quality? Like, should it be the first thing you consider? Or should I it don't even put it in the top five for myself. Okay. What would you consider more important? Um, well, for me, durability, accuracy, point of impact shift, meaning when you put the silencer on your gun, how much does it change your point of impact? Because anything you put on the muzzle, flash high or muzzle break, threading the barrel is going to change your point of impact. Um, uh, if it's a gas gun, how much back pressure, so how much more sounds coming out of uh, mm. the ejection port right into my ear, or is it making so much back pressure that the gun's now unreliable? Uh, those are important to me. Um, size and weight for me, because I do a lot of hunting and I don't want something heavy on the end of my gun um, that makes it cumbersome or makes me not want to use it in that regard. So size and weight matter okay. and you know an overall durability so you know materials engineering durability of the silence you're getting something that's lightweight but not weak uh, the sound over it shouldn't be in anyone's top three probably if you get if you go with one of the recognized like major brands you know, their most popular silencers are going to give adequate sound for almost everything. And a lot of the companies will have two sizes for 30 caliber, for instance, and that's what our company does. And the smaller ones are for me for competition or hunting where you're not going to shoot a lot of shots and I just don't want to notice the shot. And then we have larger ones that are for overall the best sound suppression we can offer. Okay. And so maybe that's a way to do it. Okay. All right, so this is kind of similar to something we already saw, but with a little bit of a different twist that I think you can address because of your military yep. experience. Um, Keegan asks, how do you feel about the Marine Corps' supposed adoption of suppressors in the infantry and other combat roles? As a former grunt and suppressor aficionado, I feel like there are going to be reliability issues. I have never seen a Marine-proof suppressor. Do you think there are... Yeah, what, what do you think? Um, I mean, I think they've got to write a good requirement. they got to stick to it. I, I mean... I, I can break anything. Uh, and so the whole marine proof thing, but there are silencers that don't hurt your accuracy, that um, don't add too much uh, weight and length to the gun, and they don't hurt the reliability of the weapon. Okay. But, you know, they've got to make a good choice, and they have to, it starts with the Marines. You've got to write the proper requirement to achieve the objective that you're after to get the best product. And if you don't write a good requirement, you're not going to get a good product. Okay. You know, I dealt with, with the military with a lot and, you know, and it got to me with, you know, sometimes what I ran into with the military or doing OEM stuff would be them wanting to tell us what they want and what it really needs to be is what are you trying to achieve? Hmm. And our job, my engineer's jobs are to figure out the best way to accomplish that. Um, so that, that's what has to happen. If it's if they're not getting good accuracy, if the guns aren't reliable, if it's easy for the Marines to break them, you know, these things need to be addressed in the requirements. And industry can make a silencer that every Marine's gonna want on their gun and it'll be useful and effective. Okay. Uh, Seth says, how much, sound re how much is sound reduction affected by using a 30 caliber suppressor on a smaller diameter host weapon? Is it worth having both a 30 and a 22 caliber can? And I assume this generally means gas guns from my experience. Um, you know, when we developed the 300 blackout cartridge 10 or 12 years ago, my old company, Advanced Armament, we sold 50 
five, five, six silencers for every 30 caliber silencer. And that's like flip flop now. If you just are worried about your hearing and sound at the shooter's ear, there's not much difference. Generally the 30 caliber silencers are going to be as effective as the five, five, six silencers. You're just going to get a little larger or heavier silencer. Um, I don't like the super tight bores on a silencer, so I would actually prefer a larger bore than most companies run for a 5.56 five, on my 5.56 five, five, gun, because what that does is put more uh, gas down the barrel and out the ejection port and into my ear and you gas in my face and, and debris and stuff like that. So I think most people um, who just want a silencer for not to be correct like what the military has or for some other reason, but for usefulness, a 30 caliber silencer and a lot of them, you know, a 30 caliber silencer now is lighter than 5.56 five, silencers were 10 years ago for the most part. It's it, effective and it works and you can use it on other guns. Okay. Unfortunately, because of the NFA, there's, there's a heavy uh, bureaucratic cost yeah. to acquiring a suppressor. Yeah, and sure. so, uh, you know, people are generally more limited than we would like in being able to just have one for every single gun. True, but but I would warn people: you can't get one silencer to do everything. Like any of the forty-six caliber silencers or whatever, where they say, "Oh, you can shoot everything from a twenty-two, three hundred one mag to a forty-five pistol." They're terrible. It's a bad user experience. I say stay away from that. So. Uh, I'm pretty biased in that regard, but when it comes to 30 cal on a 5.56, five, in a lot of cases, it's it's probably the best choice for some people. Um, but I, I will also add that almost everyone that buys a silencer, you're going to end up with one on every gun that you <laughs> shoot regularly. Like it's not something where you're going to buy, you don't have a silencer, you buy one silencer, you're only ever going to buy one. If you shoot regularly and you shoot 308, shoot 300 blackout, shoot 5.56, five, 300 wind mag, 22, you're going to end up with five silencers. It's just the way it is. Okay. So, you know, maybe some people keep that in mind. All right. Next question is from Jamie. Uh, do you foresee future designs where the gas and heat contained within the suppressor is harnessed to power or recharge electronic components in the gun? You got a lot of potential energy in there. You theoretically. do. It's a big science project, but it, you know, Ethan had my engineering has addressed this and, and, you know, his point was valid in the fact that, you know, you do it by shooting the round, by then you already needed the thing charged. So maybe it's not. It can't be a sole source of power. It can't be a sole source. And, and I don't know, there would have to be a lot of um, development and engineering and stuff poured into this and to do what and how effective is it and what someone willing to spend and how much weight and complexity does this add to the firearm? Yeah, I think the other, problem people may overlook with this is there's a lot of heat and pressure but for a very short time short time it, so it's peaks yeah you know and the idea for us like we want to get the heat of course out of the silencer and out of the barrel and stuff like that um so we don't really want to house it on the gun or near the barrel or silencer anyway for some sort of conversion to that kind of energy and i don't the government spent a lot of time energy and effort working on, you know, powered rails and things like this that just ends up not being something that's really efficient for the soldier. So I, I don't know. Okay. I mean, interesting thought, but I think that's all it is for me. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, Derek says, uh, have either of you, I guess he's referring to me as well, had the chance to shoot or know anyone that has shot an original Maxim suppressor? Mm. And how well did it perform? Have I you never have. You have it? But you have. Yeah, I, I have, I, I don't know, probably 20 or so Maxim silencers. I told you he has a lot. Yeah, and, and I've shot them, some of them I've had for 25 years. I've shot them a lot. Um, Maxim was at least 70 years ahead of his time. Everything that we have now is based on the two or three Maxim silencers that he designed. Wow. Everything. And anybody that says otherwise is not being honest. I mean, they are. It, you know, his dad was a genius. He was a genius. And in a practical sense, um, they developed, Maxim Silencer Company developed so many things that were effective. And I would say the Maxim Silencers designed in 1909 were, like, for instance, we'll pick Rimfire, were more effective 
and better sound than anything developed until the 1990s. Wow. That's so, pretty impressive. I mean, they're, they're lightweight, they're compact. There's lots of cool features. He um, coined the baffles in a way to where he could vent the, jet the gas away from the aperture, which is still the way that we cut baffles today to do it. Huh. Um, so they're great. I use them. I mean, I, I shoot them regularly, and they're still better than some of the stuff that's produced today from a sound standpoint. And they're compact, and then it's cool. You have maximum size. That was the one thing I was thinking is looking at them, they, they seem in general to be smaller than typical suppressors you'd get today. Or maybe I'm just looking at his 22s compared to modern centerfire ones. My thought would be they're probably not quite as quiet as stuff available just because of the internal volume. The last, it became... By 2000, probably, everything that we were doing was more effective, efficient, you know, per size. So, per okay. the volume. Um, but he was also limited by everything was handmade and hand-tooled right. and the, the materials weren't available. He had a lot of limitations we didn't have. So, I would argue that given that, he was even far more effective and efficient than we are now. But there are a, a number of silencers on the market that are quieter. But a lot of the maximum rimfire silencers, as you saw, they're only four and a half inches long. And yeah, and it, small in diameter, too. Very small. So some are seven eighths and some are one inch. And um, But most of them back then were shot on rifles, which a rifle. Oh, that's true. So 22 usually burns all the powder in 10 to 14 inches of barrel. And, and, and so on a 20 inch barrel, the silencer can be very small. He wasn't doing a lot for handguns back then. That's and point. handguns are very high pressure. There's a lot of unburnt powder. And a, hand, a 22 handgun is significantly louder than a 22 rifle. Like, the best silencer is barrel length, really. Um, so, so he didn't have to deal with that. So I don't think he put a lot of effort into it. So most okay. of his rimfire silencers are very small. And on a rifle, they're just as quiet as anything we make now. But on a pistol, they're not quite as effective. But okay. I don't think it was a problem. Yet. Right. People weren't using pistols nearly as much. No, I mean, you've seen. I've got two or three pistols for maximum silencers and probably 10 or 15 rifles. Yeah. And you see those all the time. And I have purchased every pistol I've ever seen set up for a maximum silencer. And I have three, maybe. Okay. So. By the way, one of the really cool things to look at is a Winchester lever action with a Maxim silencer on it. That's, cool. That's just That's cool. very cool. Yeah. All right, uh, Deviant says, uh, Ian and others have often classified categories of firearms like machine guns or submachine guns into different generations based on evolutions in technology. Have suppressors undergone, undergone similar generational leaps? And if so, what are they? But it kind of sounds like they haven't. Really. <laughs> leaps, it's kind of funny. Well, you know, it's what happens with regulation. So... Maxim and 09 developed incredible silencers. They're eccentric, so you could use the sight. Sound suppression was great. They were wonderful. They were even fast attached, interrupted threads, yeah. as you saw. So you could traditionally thread it or interrupt the thread. Like, genius. And then one thing that he did in the early 20s was he did a silencer that you could disassemble for maintenance and also made it concentric. Well, that was much easier to to manufacture okay. and, and, and volume and sell. But they were still very effective. They're great silencers. But in 34, they were regulated. So it killed the market because there was a $200 tax when the silencers were under $10. Right. And then silencers didn't really come back until World War II. And they're not as good as the Maxim designs. They're different and they're interesting. And there's a lot of quiet ones that the OSS used during World War II, which you've seen some of them here. Um, and they're great, but the Maxim stuff was ahead. And then kind of the next generation of stuff you see is all the stuff in Vietnam and psionics and Mac, and that is all total garbage. <laughs> and like everything else in the seventies that was manufactured. Like, does anybody collect stuff from the seventies? Like, I don't know. Motorcycles sucked. Cars sucked. Guns were horrible. It's like everybody came back from Vietnam and manufacturing sucked. And it was terrible. And then you started to see, to me, when some of the special operations groups were set up in the late, very late 70s, early 80s, 
you started to see. And for me with silencers, when our military started to address special operations groups and started to put money into that, and you start to see technology really improve in lots of things. We've seen dot sites, silencer technology really improved, ammunition has improved, magnified optics are way better than they were, and silencers started to slowly get better. And what's interesting is the guy, there, there is one engineer who developed a lot of that stuff in the late 70s and 80s, and who did a lot of great work. And he told me himself, he started with a 1921 Maxim silencer. <laughs> and, and that's what it's all based on. Okay. And that's when silence and silencers have steadily gotten better since then. And it's been consistent. And one great thing that happened, the $200 tax finally in the 90s wasn't a huge barrier to entry for most people. Right. And back then, too, the paperwork, <clears throat> like the background check, even when they were doing an ATF on microfish, only took 60 days. Oh. So now it's computerized. It takes 10 months ten or months, whatever. Yeah. So. Something doesn't make sense, but um, well, a lot more people are interested in them today. A lot, more, and, and the industry's big and it's profitable, and so it justifies us pursuing commercial business for it. And so you're going to continue to see technology get better, and that's exciting. Cool. Right, uh, Mark says, which is more critical for moderator, suppressor, silencer effectiveness, volume, or the extent to which the flow of gas is disrupted? Is a large volume moderator with a few baffles better or worse than a small volume? version with lots of baffles, ducts, wire, wool, etc. Well, that, that's a lot of questions, honestly. I will start with the, the number one thing if you want sound suppression is volume. Okay. That is key. That's the easiest, cheapest, best way to get it. When you have volume, a lot of things happen. They don't have to be heavy because your pressure is much lower. Hmm. The temperatures stay lower. So all these things are better. Um, but few baffles is it's generally loud unless you have considerable generally um unreasonable volume uh you know think of like a, a big coffee can for a 22 silencer or if you have like a propane bottle that you turn into a silencer can have no baffles for a 22 and it's quiet you have just that much volume um but and lots of baffles is very helpful if they're a reasonable design and not taking up too much internal volume. Baffles are very, very helpful. Okay. Um, You're saying it depends and it's all trade-offs. It is. It depends on your barrel length, your caliber. Uh, it, yeah, it depends. I mean, I'm not trying to be aloof, but volume everything is, is Everything is always all trade-offs. Yeah, and I reserve the right to change my mind as I learn more. So, Wise man. Uh, Clay says, how important is cleaning a suppressor? It's very important with a rim fire, and it's not important with a rifle. You know, keep, right. keep your muzzle device clean if it attaches to a muzzle device, and that's all you need to do. Don't worry about it. How do you clean a rim fire suppressor? All right, we have had a battery and beverage change, and let's see. Um, oh, so I was asking you, uh, how do you clean a 22 suppressor, a rim fire suppressor? Um, well, most of them now are disassemblable which that's relatively new within the last 15 years. It's important for Empire. Um, ones that have stainless steel or titanium baffles, you can put them in an ultrasonic cleaner. There, there's a lot of solvents you can use. With aluminum baffles, you got to be a little more careful. You can use, um, you know, soap and water and like plastic brush, and, or they'll come with instructions that you do. And it takes a little more elbow grease, so to speak. But, you know, you can get a silencer that weighs maybe a couple ounces, which is nice. Okay. And if you're shooting a rifle, it's not as dirty as a pistol. And shooting rapid fire, that's going to get dirtier. Some basic stuff. Okay. Our next question is from Timothy. I think I've already gotten a feel for your answer to this one. But do you feel the debate between terms like silencer versus suppressor is meaningful or just pedantic? I think it's ridiculous. Um, I don't even know why it matters. Here's everything that I think is relevant. Maxim patented, well, first of all, the Maxim Silencer Company patented the Maxim Silencer, not the suppressor. I don't like the term suppressor, even though I get some of say, oh, it doesn't silence the thing. But suppressor can be confused with a flash suppressor or other things. Mm -hmm. Silencer, definitely, you know I'm talking about a silencer. 
the ATF classified silencers, not suppressors. Um, and it, to me, you invent it, you get to name it. You know, fair. You, you get to plant the flag. You name it the silencer, I'm going to call it the silencer. Just like, you know, I, I don't. So, so I don't know. I And from a marketing standpoint, selfishly, I've always used the term silencer because when I started my company, Advanced Armament, the original one back in the day, all it was in vogue to say suppressor. So everybody made suppressors. I was like, well, I'm going to say silencer because that's what Maxim did and it makes mine sound quieter. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> it does. It is a, a, it's a nicer term. Yeah. And, and like the American, so I started the American Silencer Association um, which I'm no longer a part of, and they renamed it to the American Suppressor Association because they believe it's more likely for them to get favorable results as far as lobbying, making it sound nicer as a suppressor. Um, that seems ridiculous to me, and I hate that they're probably right, but, you know, it, it just is what it is. Like, to me, it's a muffler. Everything else, it makes a lot of noise in this country. It's mandated by the government to have a muffler on it. This is true. And, and Maxim made a lot of those early mufflers, too. Industrial stuff, yeah, yeah, for cars, submarines, industrial equipment, lawn mowers, which you've seen here. But, you know, so that's very disappointing. You can't buy a lawn mower or a weed eater or a car or a motorcycle without, it's mandated by the government that it has a muffler. But a gun that's regulated, you have to pay a tax. Uh, it's, it's stupid. So, yeah. But I don't care. Call it what you want. Just buy them. <laughs> Uh, okay, next one. PC Man says, uh, what was the first known military use of a, I'll say, silencer? I know of the well rod from World War II, but were they used in covert or military circles before then? Some. I mean, you probably know the ones I know of. Like, um, you know, Blackjack Pershing used uh, Maxim silencers on the O3 Springfield going after Pancho Villa. Uh, the Army also bought some Johnson silencers for the O3 but it wasn't very widespread. It, it seems like the OSS in World War II was the first, you know, a time that the, the government military put a lot of effort in developing silencers for different calibers, different guns, and put them into use. Okay. Certainly were dated by the fact that Maxim invented the thing in 1909. So it's not going to be any earlier than that. Yeah, and it seems like the O3 ones were around 1915 or so, I think. But yeah. That's, that's the earliest stuff I know of. Okay. Uh, Dave says, can uh, all-in-one equipment like the smuzzle, recently tested by the U.S. Army, truly be technically effective, or is it just another trade-off on all sides? Are there any historic attempts for an all-in-one solution? And I think he's talking about flash oh. suppressor, muzzle brake, and silencer. Oh, that's what that means? I believe so. Yeah, I mean, a good silencer reduces your flash, it reduces your recoil. And it reduces sound. It's, you know, uh, Knight's Armament, maybe Trey Knight, uh, I believe termed the coin signature reduction device, which hmm. I've used a lot because it is a thing. We're, we're trying to mask an environmental disturbance, which could be if you're shooting a 50 caliber prone and the dust and yeah, that environment could give you, uh, give you away to the enemy. The flash, definitely, especially in low light. Uh, sound, obviously. Uh, recoil for the shooter is great. Um, and I think most good silencers do it. it you know, here's the thing. Sometimes with a light gun or a 50 caliber, for instance, where recoil is substantial, there's a lot of effort put into the muzzle brake. So a 50 caliber muzzle brake, like a Barrett muzzle brake, for instance, are generally very effective. So if you put a silencer on there, sometimes they're not as good of a muzzle brake mm. as the real muzzle brake. But a silencer is a better muzzle brake than the average muzzle brake on the average gun. Okay. So I think you get most of those. And I think all of those things are important. They're all important for me. If I'm not shooting, like I pig hunt at night. So at night, and I'll use nods or I generally use thermal, um, flash is important. But the rest of the time for me, muzzle flash is not important. Like if I'm not in low light, I don't care. So I don't really care as much about that. But I want as little recoil as I can get. But if I'm only going to shoot a few shots and hunting, like if I'm deer hunting, I don't really care about recoil as much. If I'm with my children, I want as much sound reduction as possible because I don't want my kids wearing ear protection and I want to protect their hearing. Sure. If it's me at 47 years old, I'm not as worried about it. I just don't want the shot to be uncomfortable because I'm only going to shoot one or two or three shots max. And you can do that with a reasonable silencer for sound suppression 
and and not you know suffer a lot of hearing damage. So okay, what would you think about a device that is like sort of a mini suppressor, mini silencer that also like without adding the weight and bulk of a true, truly effective silencer. Is there any value in a little bit of sound reduction? I think there's value in any sound reduction, but I, I think a lot of, over the last five or six, maybe even 10 years, the little short silencers for centerfire rifle, most of them are terrible. And you can do just a little more. And if you're worried about the weight, you know, you can spend some time and effort and energy and engineering to reduce weight, but get uh, a, a size that's adequate to give you enough sound suppression for a few shots not to receive hearing damage. So okay. I don't like it when it's, you know, still rings my ears and my eyes want to pop out of my head and there's a giant fireball comes out of the silencer just to look cool by having a tiny silencer. That doesn't do anything for me. All right, we have two more. Uh, okay. Felix says, what are your views on the Russian slash Soviet oh. suppressed ammunition? Like the oh. captive piston stuff. It's so great. Um, <laughs> I mean, most of the stuff the Soviets have done. I mean, I love Soviet weapons. They put a lot of effort into signature and sound reduction. Um, they've done great cartridges, 9 by 13 and then they've done captured piston stuff. I've shot some of the captured, pist uh, captured piston stuff. It's great. The problem with most of that, the Russian ones that I've shot, they were designed for very close quarter stuff. Hmm. So it's effective at that range, but it's not accurate or effective much beyond, you know, the size of a standard room. Okay. Um, but it's expensive and complicated. And, and of course the ATF, I think, regulates capture piston ammo as a silencer for every round. They probably would, yeah. Yeah, so it makes it useless here. But the concept is great. The Soviets have done so many interesting things, and I, and I like it. Is it really that quiet? It's quiet. It's quiet with no silence. I mean, yeah, the silencer is basically in the ammo. It's nice. The stuff, I've shot two different guns. They were both. I was amazed how quiet they were. I was pleasantly surprised and very impressed. Nice. Yeah, but they were also much less range than I was anticipating and less accurate. Okay. It's almost like everything's trade-offs and compromises. <laughs> About that, yeah. Very few magic solutions for this stuff. All right, and our last question is from Faze, who says, "In the development of wipe, yeah, sorry, is the development of wipe-based suppressors really less fruitful than baffle-based designs, or is it just held back by ATF rulings on suppressor parts?" Definitely not. Um, definitely not held back by ATF. I mean, don't get me wrong. ATF is a huge pain in the ass. However. Um, I, I've made and, and I've shot other companies and individuals wipe silencers that are very effective for sound, but they're, and we're working on a project actually currently in house right now for a military program with a wipe silencer. Hmm. They're horrible for accuracy. I figured they had horrible. It, it's, it's terrible. I hate it. You're literally shooting through an obstruction every single time. Yeah. It makes sense. Doesn't it? Um, it's terrible for that. They can be great for sound. It can get you a small package, but generally you're limited by five to 15 shots and you got to replace it all. And so, you know, like anything like that, it has its place, but listen, if the ATF just pulled their finger out of that and let us do whatever we wanted, there's very few silencers that are going to contain wipes that consumers are going to want because it's not that useful. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. I think uh, I know a lot well, of these questions you. are not necessarily the most complex ones, but uh, I'm still very much in a learning stage about this stuff. And I think a lot of the folks watching are as well. Well, so. me too. Um, no, the, these are good. And I'm so excited that it, it just continues the interest in silencers to grow. So, I mean, I, I hope I'm 90 years old and still answering these questions. <laughs> You're clearly extremely passionate about the subject and that's fun to be around. Yeah, I do like it. I do like it. I mean, it enhances the shooting experience. It turns it into, you know, for a recreational, from a recreational standpoint, it turns shooting into like golf. You can yeah. hang out with your buddies, you talk, you communicate, you can have a good time. Like I have fun with my friends going to the movies, but we don't get to hang out, you know? And, and, and when you go shoot with 
ear protection and those sorts of things. It's the same thing. But when you go golf, you know, you hang out, you bullshit, you drink beer, it's fun. And this is what silencers do for recreational shooting. And then from the military perspective, it gives our soldiers an advantage from a signature reduction standpoint. So I, I love and appreciate that. Like I want fewer, fewer of our guys to be injured or killed and I want more terrorists killed. So it's hard to argue with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks to all the folks on Patreon who uh, submitted questions for us today. I appreciate them. You had some really good ones in there. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get all of them, but if you would like to uh, get your own question into the next Q&A, uh, check out Patreon. I've got a link where you can sign up and also help support Forgotten Weapons uh, every single month in the description text below. Thanks again to Kevin Brittingham for joining us, and uh, we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching.